Hello and welcome to episode six of six, maybe ESPN plus <laughs> <laughs> North Point plus anyway, <laughs> North Point plus uh, we'll get to our uh, intentional coordination of rivalry outfits. <laughs> Outfits? You ca- uh, outfits. <laughs> I'm Costumes? Showing, I'm showing my lack of sports <laughs> knowledge here. <laughs> there, There is a reason why we're wearing the gear that we're wearing. Yes, and we'll get to it later. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. Yes, so this is episode six of North Point Plus. Yes. Uh, this is our follow-up podcast to our messages on Sundays. So if you're new here, if you're following along, uh, every Sunday we have our message, and then North Point Plus gives us an opportunity to answer questions, to dive deeper into God's Word, and just to hang out, which is yeah. always a blast. Welcome. Yeah, so I'm one of your hosts. I'm Mark Adkins. To my left is, or really you're in front of me here, not even at my left. Uh, well, yeah. You're here. Rick Rubel. Um, on the right side of your screen. <laughs> yes, my left, your right. Uh, Rick, you spoke yesterday on Second John. I did, and you just dropped a lot, and then you walked away. <laughs> uh, that's right. I, dro- I dropped the mic. I, I said. I, I said to somebody afterwards. I felt like I was back um, in my role as a college professor, yeah. just kind of teaching through stuff. Yeah. No, it was great. So we went through Second John. So we're going out of order, which is always right. fun. So we did Third John last week, Second John this week. Uh, we're not doing First John. Nope, it's too long. It's too it's, long. It's not one of the sticky notes. John got overambitious and that's right. Too long. Five so. chapters. What was he thinking? <laughs> Selfish. <laughs> um, so for for those that need a refresher, because there's so much yeah. in Second John for for 13 verses. Right. That dude packed it in. <laughs> yeah. So give me give me like a, a a 45 second high level view of the book of Second John. So, so uh, John writes to a church, I, I think to a church, to the chosen lady uh, and her children. Um, he talks initially a lot about truth, and that's really kind of the foundation for the letter. Yeah. Um, from truth, he talks about really what that truth causes you to do and, and kind of what the solution is in terms of how we're supposed to live. Yeah. Um, and that's to love, yeah. uh, a command to, to love each other. Um, then he talks about a problem that exists, that, there are fa- that there's false teaching that's going on. And then he gives uh, really kind of the heart of the letter is four verses where he talks about uh, the the dangerous consequences of following false teaching. And then he concludes with just kind of nice greetings saying, hey, man, <laughs> the other churches love you. Say hey to everybody, all that good stuff at the end. Yeah. So in, in thinking through how we're going to tackle Second John, we have some questions that were submitted, and we thought, you know, it would just be good to go back through right. that uh, that layout of the book to just kind of make sure we touch on everything again, because there's so much that can be, I mean, you could do a whole series <laughs> on just yeah. a few verses in Second John, because there's so much there. So uh, I first wanted to talk, to go back to the beginning of the book, um, and you emphasized it in the message, and John obviously talks about it, this idea of truth. John just right. says truth over and over and over again. Yeah. Even the truth. This is the truth. Truth, truth, truth. Um, and how in our society, we like the word truth <laughs> in its own relative context. Um, so Rick can have his truth that can disagree with my truth. That's totally okay. That's, that's a I'm, true statement. That's a true statement <laughs> that <laughs> is is laughable, literally. Yeah. Um, and so our, our our culture, I think, as you identified, struggles with the the Christian worldview of Rick can't have his truth that disagrees with actual, objective, real truth. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back, revisit yeah. that, unpack that, um, and talk about it in in the. Um, in the context of tolerance, because that was something else that you had right. mentioned um, in, in the book of Second John, and Donna Seeger uh, uh, kind of brought up this point of tolerance again. She she submitted a, a question, comment, request um, to talk more about tolerance in the church, um, right. how that definition of tolerance has changed and shifted over the last 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and what I really want to drive down to is that dividing line of things that we can tolerate and things that we that we as the church should not tolerate. Right. And truth is ultimately that dividing line. So there's my there's my bomb for yeah. you. <laughs> the, um, it. Yeah, dive in, go there. <laughs> the, the Probably the first thing that I think I, I just want to reinforce is how important it, it is that we really get that there's absolute truth, yeah. that there is stuff that doesn't change, yep. that is true no matter, uh, no matter what you think. It doesn't matter if you agree with it or disagree with it. It's true. Yeah. It's, it, it is reality. And that truth of who Jesus is, of uh, God being the creator of the universe, that um, those 
that truth shapes how we view the world, how we view ourselves, how we interact with other people. Yeah. And and if you can't embrace that, it just it makes conversation very very difficult because you can't search for truth. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that one of the um, one of the highest uh, calls on our life is to search for truth. Yeah. And so um, if if I discover um, truth in a place that I didn't anticipate it, yeah. I need to discern whether that's really true, whether it's my perception of, of, of truth or reality. Um, and if it's true, then I have to decide, do I align my life with that truth hmm. or not? And I, th I, think, uh, I think that's really the, the story for most people in terms of their interaction with Jesus. Yeah. When they come to the place that they say, oh, Jesus was really a person who really lived, who really died, who really lived a sinless life, mm -hmm. and he died as a as a substitution. Uh, he he took my sin on himself. Yeah. If all that's true, and he resurrected, I can't I can't just sit on the sidelines and say, "Oh, that's nice, that's good." Mm -hmm. I, it compels me to act differently, to live differently. And so, yeah. so the importance of, of absolute truth, um, Jesus either died or he didn't. He either resurrected or he didn't. Yeah. And if those things are true, that has lots and lots of ramifications. So um, when you get to the question in terms of tolerance and, and how that fits both in the church and in our culture, I, I, um, I don't have any trouble at all with the the concept that as a nation, as a country, we were founded with religious liberty, with um, the ability for people who had very different views of Scripture um, to coexist and and to uh, and to be free to to worship on their own. Yeah, that doesn't mean that everyone was was right in terms of their their understanding of Scripture and what they were called to do. In our culture, tolerance, religious tolerance, tolerance of right and wrong has just grown to a place that um, you basically can do whatever you want and say, oh, this is my reality, this is my truth, right. and it's all okay. Um, I would say, wh where do you draw the line in terms of tolerance? I think it starts with us, um, with, with um, what I am going to tolerate in my life, yeah. that I either say what Scripture says is sin and, and um, live accordingly, Yep. I, you know, I, I repent, I do the things that, that Scripture calls me to do, or, um, or I say, ah, it doesn't really matter, and I, and I tolerate uh, any other kind of perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have any trouble at all tolerating the choices that other people make at, at, um, in their lives. My heart grieves because I know that there's going to be, um, you make the wrong choices, there's going to be um, implications, there's going to be carnage that comes as yeah. a result of that. Um, in the church, um, th it's interesting that the, that uh, John uses the phrase truth and grace, truth mm -hmm. and grace, um, that both things go hand in hand, that there is the call to truth that doesn't change, yep. but also a call to grace in terms of how we respond to, to people. I want us, I want me to, um, to stand for truth and to recognize sin for sin. Yep. I want to be filled with grace as I deal with, with people who may not know Jesus yet, even as I deal with, I, I want to be filled with grace with people who are followers of Jesus that sin, but I want to call them to truth. Yeah. And um, I don't want to just um, turn, a, turn an eye at that yeah. and, and just kind of wink and nod and say, eh, it's okay, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Well, I think, I think too, looking at, uh, you know, Donna mentioned, like, it seems like the definition has changed over the years, yeah. and, which I think is a, an astute observation. I think now, culturally, tolerance means affirm. Yeah, endorse. Yeah. So if we, if we as the church say we tolerate this, the world hears the church affirms it. And so you right. Have this kind of, you have to play the, the clarification game of, well, you think tolerate means this, I think it means this. Um, and I think that's the beauty of John's letter is John doesn't call you to tolerate. John no. calls you to love. Right. And that, I think, is the Christian call. It, like, that is so clear throughout Scripture that Jesus doesn't say, tolerate your enemies. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Love your enemies. Like, you're yeah. going beyond just this tolerance. And so tolerance in the church comes down to, again, like, we know we're not going to be perfect. We know there's going to be sin in the lives of everyone that's involved in the church. And so that level of tolerance, whatever you want to mean by yeah. that, is going to be there. And that's where you love that person and call them to the truth 
right. and grace. Um, and that's, I think, the beauty of, of what yeah. John has in his letter. That that love is going to exhibit itself in hard conversations sometimes. Yes. Um, and, and as a result of it, there are going to be broken relationships that come because of that. But that's that's the grace piece that comes along with the truth. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Which I, I think leads into, the, uh, there's that next part of the letter that um, John talks about. This is what love looks like. Yeah. Love looks like obedience, which looks like love. <laughs> right. <laughs> which brings you into this. It's the command of love. Circular yeah. reasoning. Um, yeah. But it's it's good. And so I, it, it, it brings up this interesting question that I think, again, our culture, our society re- really struggles with this idea of loving everyone again love is probably one of those words that's shifted in definition over the years um, right and so for us uh, you know the question that i think often comes up is do we and should we and how do we love people that hurt us not just people that have hurt yeah. us but are still hurting us how do we walk as christians in that in love in obedience which leads back to love in pain right the, yeah, l- love love is not a warm, squishy feeling, except in a very narrow right. definition. Yeah. Um, and so the 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 opening question, I mean, the heart of that question really is: Am I really called to love people no matter what? Yeah. And the answer to that, as a follower of Jesus, is yeah. I mean, that's that's clearly what John says. This is a command: yeah. love one another. Yep. Love one another. Not love one another if they're nice to you. Not love one another when it's easy. Not love yep. one another if you have a lot in common. Um, he says, love one another. Yeah. And um, and that that's what distinguishes us from the world in terms of the love that that we have for each other as as um, as followers of Jesus, but also the way that we communicate that to the world. Yeah. Um, the uh, the question of how that happens is a secondary question. And what that looks like, and and again, to love is not necessarily to tolerate. Yep. Um, to love is or to, to affirm, or or to affirm. Yep. That's right. Um, to love is to care about someone enough to say, "Man, you're on a path that's going to self destruct." Yeah. And and I care about you too much to see you to do that, to yep. crash your car into the wall. Um, and so uh, to have the conversation and have that out of love, yeah. uh, you know, truth and grace, kind of kind of a deal. The um, it, it really is. I, I said this in the message yesterday. I um, I have a burden. I think for to to say to we who follow Jesus to say we're called to love people, even when we don't get any love back, mm-hmm. um, even when we're persecuted, even when um, when. When they're when people are hurtful to us, that doesn't mean that we don't have good boundaries. That's a part of love too, yep. um, but it means that the interaction that we have with the people who are hurting us continues to be one of love. Um, and again, the big picture of that, you, you may say that's not fair, that's not right. <laughs> that's the picture of God. Yeah. Even when we hurt Him, He continues to love us. Even when we disappoint him even when we go our own path even yep. when we're headed for destruction god still loves us yep. and and we're called to live that out here on earth yep. to to imitate him in that way yeah well and i think i think a lot of that comes down to again we're just we're diving into the definition of words and which might sound yeah. boring but <laughs> it's not to us <laughs> when we look at even uh, how our culture views forgiveness i think right a lot of people just kind of view you know the term of forgive is to you know forgive and forget and right. that, that's what that means is we forget about it. So the consequences are gone. The hurt is all gone. If I forgive you, I forget everything about it. And that's not really what forgiveness is scripturally. I mean, to look at what it took Jesus to bring about forgiveness. Jesus yeah. was tortured, <laughs> murdered, <laughs> right, put to death, put into a tomb, rose from the grave. And that is what forgiveness looked like. <laughs> Yeah, to bring that about, and so yeah. for us, it's not just this like, oh, whatever, I forgive you. Like, there's a cost to me forgiving someone that's not asking for it, even if they are asking for it. There's a cost yeah. on my end to absorb that hurt, to to give that to the cross. Yeah, to I give it up, to is give the up the desire yeah. for retribution and um, to right. uh, inflict pain on the other person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Gosh, there's so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so John moves on in his letter. Um, so we have the foundation, the solution, 
uh, and then we get to this problem yeah, and of teaching. Yeah, and the, and the problem was fa- was false teachers. Yeah. That you know there were guys going around teaching things that John says are antichrist. Yeah. There um there are things that are in direct conflict with the saving nature of Jesus. They're they're um they're not minor issues, but they were they were teachers that were trying to um derail yeah. the heart of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, and so this uh, <laughs> brings up for me what I think is the natural question when we hear it is for false teaching is how do we tell <laughs> how do we do, how do we how do we and, and we for North Point language what we often say is we major in the major we minor in the minors correct so to basically explain that is there's major theology that is very important to us it's the, a, it's essential the authority of scripture yep. who Jesus is Jesus is the only way to salvation things like that those are the majors correct and then Everything else that's not the majors is the minors, which right. is a big, big basket of There's stuff. There's a lot of stuff there. So yeah. how do we, as followers of Christ, faithfully discern what is a major and what is a minor so that we don't label everyone a false teacher? Yeah, I, I, I think it comes back to the foundation of the letter in, ter- in terms yeah. of the search for truth, that you say, okay, yeah. is this critical to the nature of the gospel yeah. that... that um, that our sin separates us from God, yeah. that Jesus came to bridge that gap and to die in our place, um, that he physically died, that he physically resurrected. Um, and th- th- those, are the, those are the majors. That's, um, you know, those are the things that we won't hedge on, yeah. that we can count on the authority of Scripture. Yeah. Um, these particular false teachers were saying, eh, Jesus, he didn't really come in the flesh. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he was kind of the spirit. He didn't really die. He didn't really resurrect. And that was false teaching that, that John said, man, you can't go there at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think f- for, for those that are like, okay, I just I want to have a clear line. I mean, the best place for me is scripture. Right. Paul talks about it in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 lays out like this is what the gospel is that Christ died according right. died for our sins according to the scripture was buried rose again yeah. according to the scripture so Paul himself goes back to scripture and says it's about Christ sin death resurrection like those that's the essential stuff yeah um, the things that are clearly laid out yep um, that you don't have to go to a theologian or a right. commentary to have explained yeah. um, and and uh, and lined out um, later later in the in the letter when John talks about running on ahead. Yeah, uh, um, those are the things that I think um, that that really are. They may be they may not be um, the right teaching, yep. but when you start making the connections of stuff and then preaching that, teaching that with the authority of Scripture, mm. say this is what you've got to believe, that's where you run into trouble. Yeah, and that's, I think, someone provided to me a, a, a definition of what legalism is, and legalism is making my rules God's rules. Right. So my Absolutely. rules become the authority of Scripture. So you have to dress really nice on Sundays because yeah, that's my rule, and that's what God wants. And so that's, yeah. Not yeah, let, let me that. let me just jump on that because that that's really something that for me is is a big deal. Yeah, when I study scripture, um, I may I may study scripture and see a principle there, and define oh that means that I need to do this. That principle is being applied in my life in this particular area. Yeah, um, the uh, you know I, I'm I'm gonna. Um, here's an example. I'm, I'm going to abstain from sexual sin, so I'm not going to... That, that's the call from Scripture. So I'm not going to watch R-rated movies. The, um, the, the, um, that would be a principle applied in a, in a life. Um, for me to say to everyone, you can't watch an R-rated movie right. because that's in violation of Scripture. That's that sense of legalism, and that's, that's connected dots that aren't there. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's a great example. So, so in this in this context of identifying false teachers, um, Karina uh, submitted a question that I think is yeah. is a great question. It, it's it's helpful for us to think through this. Uh, and basically, the the premise of her question that I'm kind of adding on to because I yeah. want I want to make it broader. Uh, when it comes to North Point or other churches and ministries that we 
interact with, whether it be m- music that we sing, uh, books that we have on the shelves, uh, things that we do in life groups, uh, studies on right now, you know, what, whatever. Um, when it comes to interacting with those, um, one of the things you had mentioned is, you know, we don't associate. John is clear. Do not associate with false yeah. teachers. Don't open your home. Um, right. Don't protect them. All those kind of things. So in this context of our global connected world where there's so many things that connect and all these all these ways into other churches, ministries and other authors and, and all that, how do we handle that as a church where people might not align, people might teach things that are different, there's songs that we sing, books that we... What, how do we handle that? How's that fit? <laughs> that that's a great question, and um, and this is one of those things that, that um, is not clear and cut and dry. It's it's right. it's just really complicated because um, we have the ability to search and find stuff um, at a level of depth that I think has never existed before. I think at its at its most basic level the call of both staff and eldership would be to say, we're never going to have a speaker come in to teach from God's Word that, um, that has a perspective that we would say that doesn't, that's not consistent with Scripture. Yeah. That w- we just wouldn't do that. We wouldn't use um, material um, to teach with that, that uh, reflects that. Yep. Um, the the place where it gets uh, much much harder is when you look at um, particular product or um, material that's available. So, like when I'm when I'm um, studying messages, studying four messages, I'm going to use um, a wide variety of commentaries of uh, of stuff that comes from all kinds of places to try and help understand the scripture and to try and help figure out how to communicate that. Um, the the uh, when I do that, I'm looking for truth with capital T, um, uh, and I'm only going to use stuff that's true uh, in in my presentation. That's my desire, um, and I I hope if I get off base that somebody's going to say, "Ah, Rick, you're off base on that." Yeah. Um, the uh, in, in terms of as a church, there's so much stuff that's available. We we were talking earlier today before the pike podcast about this about where it where it fits because it's so easy to to get material from lots of places that may communicate God's truth in in incredible ways great um, illustration great teaching great concept but other teaching in the area uh, from the person who wrote that may not be what we agree with at all I would say this uh, you know be very careful about that. And, um, and ask the question whether the person who is communicating that, that you're getting it from, are they a follower of Jesus or not? You know, are we going to agree on the majors? Are we brothers and sisters in Christ? And that's a great starting place. I think, I think that it, um, for me, in the preparation of the message, as I was trying to think through how to communicate that, um, I think that there's a difference in using stuff that people have available that I may not agree with, uh, I may not agree with other aspects of their teaching, right. um, and just send in the money to say, "Oh, here's a check to support your ministry." Um, the uh, it, it's it's a complicated it's, yeah. it's an issue. Enormously complicated. And and again, the hard thing is, our desire is to like to have it be. This is the clear line. Right. Everything here is good. Everything here is bad. And unfortunately, like if you were to do that for me, I'm gonna end up on the bad side. <laughs> like, right. Um, so, I think again, the important thing for us, and that's why I'm, I'm, it's good that John wrote the letter this way, or the Holy yeah. Spirit inspired John to write this letter this way, is that you begin and end with truth. Right. If they affirm the truth of sin, Christ, His saving power, and everything that goes along with that, then my interaction with that author, that church, that ministry, their product, whatever it might be, comes in the context of the church. Right. Not as false teacher, heretic, cast out as Paul. Like you can read through Paul's letters where he's talking to Timothy, where he's talking, where John's talking about false teachers. And the tone is very different when it's your brother that might be wrong right. and a teacher that is false. That's yeah. That's, that's trying to derail right. the centrality of the gospel. Yeah. That it's, it's funny. Cause I, I, 
um, we were talking about this before, and I, I think back to a number of times over the years when I've gone to conferences or meetings or whatever to listen to, to people talk and teach. And afterwards, I would say to somebody that, that I was friends with in ministry or whatever, and I went to this particular conference, and they'd go, you went there? <laughs> you listen to what they said. <laughs> um, and, and I think the challenge for us is to be so committed to the truth of Scripture that we're able to glean what's true and throw away what's false, and that, that we do that um, in a constant striving for truth. Yeah. Um, I, I love the word glean. It's not, that's not, you know, not many of us are farmers anymore, <laughs> <Calvin> but, <vernacular. laughs> but, but the whole idea that they would, um, they would take the kernels of, um, of, of uh, what? Wheat. <laughs> what um, you glean? <laughs> they, 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 they would go back through and pick up the, the pieces that were good out of all the chaff. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's the call. I mean, obviously, we're not trying to be the arbiters of all truth. Right. So the call on us as the call on any Christ follower is to be discerning, be right. in the word. Like if you're listening to a teacher, you're taking part in a resource and things are starting to veer off track from scripture, like you're equipped with the right. Holy Spirit to know that and discern that. And obviously we're here to help guide and, and ask prompting questions and, and right. be helpful to be discerning in that. Um, but that's the call of every Christ follower is to, uh, I, I think of Paul um, commending the Bereans, the, this right. group of people that when Paul would preach, these Bereans wouldn't believe him until they went to Scripture themselves. Studied it themselves. Like, oh, okay, now we yeah. believe Paul. <laughs> we get it. We get it, yeah. So that call, I think, is is still on us to be discerning, yeah. whatever we do. Um, the, the next section, <laughs> <laughs> uh, verse 8 in 2 John talks about... Uh, well, the, the first part of the verse is, watch yourselves, that you may not lose what we have worked for. And that poof, just brings up yeah. probably um, the, the longest running debate <laughs> in the church. We're, we're going to try and still have this podcast be shorter than Jake's a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, le, let me, uh, if you had the app notes open, you'll notice that I had a, a kind of a synopsis of Calvinism that was there because this verse is really problematic for um, for people who have adopted a Calvinistic theology, because there seems to be this teaching that says you can lose something um, in your faith, mm-hmm. and um, and so when you read it, if you embrace all of of Calvin's theology, it's like oh that can't mean this, right? Even though when you read it, it seems like. Yes, that's what it means. Um, so the the really short version in terms of Calvin, some, some big picture stuff. And I, I said yesterday, we stand in the shadow of Luther. We stand in the shadow of Calvin. Yep. And so our perception, our understanding of the words oftentimes is the result of the way that things were defined and then translated to English by Luther, um, by Calvin, by Zwingli, you know, whoever it is. Um, and so... Um, the the big picture tenets of of Calvinism are is that um, the, uh, it's expressed in the word tulip. Total depravity is the first concept. It's this concept that man is born in sin. That before they're ever born, they have this stamp of sinfulness that's on them. Um, uh, the U is um, unconditional election. That God chooses that God is the one who makes the decision before we're ever born, who's in, who's out, and that God chooses to save some, and that by nature of that, that somehow God chooses not to save some. Um, limited atonement, that there's, a, that's the L, that there's a specific number of people that are going to be saved and everybody else is going to be lost. Um, irresistible grace, that, that if you're chosen by God, that God is going to construct circumstances in such a way that you can't help but respond to Him because He's chosen you, and so um, so you don't have any um, any choice really in in the matter. And perseverance of the sa- saints that that's the P piece that um, that says you know what there's there's not really anything that you can do that once you're chosen you're going to continue that that uh, relationship you have with Jesus is going to continue no matter what. Um, that's probably an overly simplistic, <laughs> and um, I've got the Ohio State shirt on. Mark, um, anything that you would say in your Michigan shirt about um, ab- about that particular 
perspective on theology. Yeah, I think um, I liked opening up the app notes and seeing uh, seeing Tulip because yeah. <laughs> uh, that's something I grew up with. I'm 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 outing myself um, as a Calvinist. Um, people like I've always joked that however however many points of Calvinism there are, I probably ascribe to them. I will say this is what I usually tell people: I don't like being called a Calvinist uh-huh. because I don't like ascribing my theology to a person yep to a name just like i, th- I think i mean I, I felt the same when i used to go to a lutheran church i was like we're ascribing all of our theology to martin luther when he's probably wrong about some things right about other things right. um but in its premise calvinism mainly revolves around that that doctrine of salvation um how god orchestrated designed and saves um so yeah i'm outing myself as a calvinist but i think the way you discussed it um in the message yesterday that North Point is not a Calvinist church. It's right. not a not Calvinist church, the Armenian right. view. It's a Bible church. Right. And so when we come to scripture, that's, I think it, it's a beautiful picture to, to remind ourselves that we do stand in the shadow of Luther and Calvin and Edwards and Spurgeon right. and, you know, n- name, yeah. name your yeah. preacher um, that influences our preconceived notions of when we get to a piece of scripture, oh, it must mean this because... Calvin said this, or it must not mean this because Calvin said that. Um, and it's helpful just to to set that aside, not because they could be right or wrong, but because I don't get my right and wrong. I don't get my truth, if we're going back to truth. I don't right. get my truth from Calvin. Correct. We get truth Absolutely. from Scripture. Yeah, and, and that's, I think, the challenge, whether whether you ascribe to um, teachings of Calvin, yeah. which are a lot, Right. Uh, um, yeah. Or you, or you ascribe to the teachings of Jacob Arminius yep. or or not? Um, what matters is what Scripture says. And what's funny is um, now in 2021, um, much of the terminology yep. and much of the conversation was really shaped in the 1800s. Uh, you know, right. Um, right. long and, after Calvin. <laughs> long after Calvin. And so so the words are packed with meaning that maybe were not there originally. And the challenge is to go back and and look at truth because yeah. Calvin didn't live until the 17th century. And so um, it, it's it's not like oh all of a sudden John Calvin understood something that no one had understood for the first 1600 years. Right. Um it, it's that he was trying to make sense of stuff. Um, it's not that Ar- Arminius uh, understood things, um, you know, for the first time right. at, at about the same time. There is the sense that w- if you want to dive into theology and really go there, it's going to take a lot more than a 25-minute <laughs> video, 30-minute video, whatever. Um, but, man, I, I discovered some really interesting things. It, just in terms of, like, for me, where, where I would fit, I'm, I'm not a five-point Calvinist, but I would say, um, from a biblical sense, I do believe in the depravity of man. Scripture teaches that, that um, as in when Adam sinned, we all sinned. Now, what that's come to mean in a, in a Reformed theology, in a Calvinistic theology, is yep. that, that you're stamped with this bent to sin from before you were ever born. And it's interesting that that concept didn't even exist until about 400 AD. For the first 300 years, there was a much clearer sense of the depravity of man, that it was like, you know what, when you become an adult, and you choose to go your own way apart from God, that's the depravity of man that's showing up in your, in your life. I, I absolutely believe in that. We all have this bent towards sin. But um, Augustine, in the early 400s, um, he articulated for the first time that, that, um, that people are born in this depraved nature. They're born with that, and that's what led to infant baptism. Because if you're depraved when you're born, you've got to do you got to do you something. <laughs> um, and so, um, when when you start to study and unpack that, that's a that's a um, you re- you really need to try and separate time and culture yep. and go back to the truth of Scripture to say where's this fit. So so what our Arminius think pretty much the opposite of Calvin, um, um, that, that there is a clear sense um, that there is a free will, that man has a free will, that, that Jesus came to die for everybody, that everyone can uh, respond to him. I think that, that anybody who's Arminian would even say that there's a sense of irresistible grace that comes from God, that, that, um, that if you truly encounter Jesus, man, 
Why would it's, you say that? Yeah, it's <laughs> like that's the best thing ever. And, and so that there's a sense in which God, God's grace is irresistible in that. I think anybody who's Armenian would, um, would say, you know what, there is this sense of the importance of the perseverance of the saints, not in the sense that, that, um, that you're preserved, but that you're persevering, that you're living that out on a right. daily basis, not that you have to be afraid of losing your faith, anything like that, but there is the sense of, no, I walk with Jesus every day. And, and I think when you look at verse 8, and says, and it says, there is something that can be lost because of the false teaching that comes. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. Um, you know, I can, I can tell you what a lot of theologians think. Um, I don't know what that means, but I, but I do know that false teaching can derail our faith, and, um, and we've got to be just very aware of that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, when you, when you look at Calvinism and Arminianism, I mean, these are things that Satan, I think, uses to divide the church. And it's not to say that Calvinism is of Satan and Arminianism is of Satan. Right. But I think Satan looks at things that divide people and tries to amplify that. Right. Which is why you tend to find Calvinist churches and not Calvinist churches. Um, and that's part of why we jokingly, I mean, we're not, that, we that's are why Michigan that, and Ohio State fans. That's not a joke. <laughs> um, it was intentional for us to wear that. Uh, yes. Because... I'm Calvinist. You're not Calvinist. Correct. And you and I have no trouble worshiping together, right. wor- worshiping in unity under that. And I think that's, I mean, when, when we get down to brass tacks, you think I'm wrong about Calvinism. Uh, yeah, I would and, think that. And I think yeah. you're wrong about Calvinism. Yeah. Right. Like, we can say that. Right. And that's not a big deal. That's nothing. <laughs> that because it's not a major. Right. It's, 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 not, uh, it's not an issue of faith that should separate right. us. Right. And both of our perspectives, both of our understandings are driven by how we interpret certain scriptures. Right. Um, so, so for me, when I look at Second Timothy and it says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to know him. For me, that's like, wait a second. It's talking about all. Uh, it's, that's, <laughs> that means everybody. Uh, right. You forgot so love the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, that right. means whoever <laughs> believes in him, not just a certain portion. Right. Um, and w- and our understanding of how that gets spelled out would be different, and that's okay. Right. Yeah, and that's I think again the beauty of what we pursue as a church, as North Point, right. is being united under that banner of Christ and letting the ma- the the minors kind of shake out, and we can have discussions and have the back and forth, so long as that continues to push us toward truth in Jesus. Right. Absolutely. And um, frankly. The Ohio State Michigan thing is probably a bigger deal. It's probably more contentious. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to lose more followers for that. (laughs) If you're still watching, because you can see our shirts. That's right. Awesome. Well, this uh, this has been great. Um, I think I think we've about covered Second John. Is there anything else? Um, that you want to touch no, on. I, I, I would just reinforce that the that those four verses from eight to eleven that talk about the the um, danger of um, embracing false teaching and um, being waylaid by it. Hmm. Those are those are real serious things. Yeah, I, you've heard me say um, if, if you've been a part of North Point for very long. Um, f- frankly, what I think doesn't matter. What um, what Billy Graham says doesn't matter what the pope says doesn't matter what you know name your name your favorite preacher um doesn't matter what matters is what scripture says that's the truth that we've got to pursue and that we've got to use that to um discern and help us understand all the rest of scripture um and and understand both our sinfulness and god's great love for us and how we respond to him yeah that's great it's a great way to end it all right. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for submitting questions, and we'll we'll see you see guys you next, next week. week.